Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Bringing Innovation and Creativity the Hybrid Workplace Part 1, focusing on funding government IT. I'm Brenda Decker, Senior Fellow with the Center for Digital Government, and I'm excited to serve as the host for today's webcast. Today's presentation is possible thanks to our corporate partners, Lumen and Cisco. Thanks for joining us, and we're going to have a great session over the next hour. Before we dive into the content, I want to share a few brief housekeeping notes. After today's live webcast, the recording will be available on demand. Please use the recording for your reference or feel free to pass it on to a colleague. We've designed this webcast to be interactive so you can participate in the questions and answers with us by submitting your questions into the Q&A. Send in your questions as they come up throughout the presentation and we'll address as many of them as we as we can during the Q&A portion. Also during today's webcast, you'll be able to connect with your peers via LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. For those of you on Twitter, please use hashtag GovTechLive to share key takeaways, quotes, and learnings from today's webcast. Currently, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers, and if you're experiencing any media player issues or have any other technical problems, please visit help.webex.com. Joining me today, we have four speakers to discuss this topic. Gary DePreta is the Area Vice President for Cisco Public Sector. In his role, he and his team help public sector agencies improve how citizens are served through innovative approaches leveraging world-class technologies. Sonia Ramsey is the Regional Vice President for State and Local Government and Education for Lumen. She is a transformational leader and turnaround specialist with 20 years of experience. Her expertise in delivering differentiated digital experiences and customer focused solutions transfers well to the public sector to aid, to aid state and local government agencies in embracing transformation and to thrive. Dan Leister is the senior manager for Cisco Public Funding Office. He and his team help customers navigate the maze of public sector funding programs and provide guidance on how to bring their vision to life. The funding office is available to help better understand the funding opportunities for technology that are available through stimulus funds, grants, bonds, and E-rate. And finally, Tully Manross is the National Director for Public Sector in the SLED Business Development for Lumen. Known as a strategy and business development expert for SLED, she and her team work collaboratively to support the needs of state and local government agencies, K-12, and our higher education institutions across the United States. I think we're gonna have a great session. So Dan, would you please get us started by providing a lay of the land in regards to funding opportunities? Absolutely, Brenda, thank you. Um, let me pull up my uh, screen, but I, I wanna start by really just thinking all of you that are on the call for the opportunity that we have to present and talk a little bit about public funding today. Um, it's, it's always exciting um, and, and it's such a huge opportunity. Um, bear with me here. Brenda, it's not allowing me to share a screen. So I'm just gonna give me a second as I pull up the, the document here. As was mentioned, I'm part of the public funding office at Cisco and I manage our team. And, it, and it's a unique opportunity of where we're at. Um, when I look at the funding office historically at Cisco, we, we really were designed to help ensure the legality and um, ensure that Cisco is not jeopardizing any of the rules and regulations or those valuable dollars that are out there for you. Um, over this last 18 months, a lot has changed. And, and now we have the opportunity to help navigate the, all the funds that are available, are available to you. Um, now, I, I, I'm having trouble pulling this up. Would you like me to share the slides for you, Dan? Let me see if this helps. 
it should be opening now. I apologize for this delay. It says it's loading. I think, Dan, in the work environment we're all in, every single person on this call has experienced exactly what we're doing right now. So, it, Isn't it true? And, and I think that you bring up a good point is, is, is over, over the last 18 months is the importance of, of the transition to a hybrid workplace and, and how we rely on digital now. So today I'm gonna to introduce you to the public funding office, and then we're gonna to touch at a high level of the available funds that are out there. It's constantly changing on a daily basis, and then we'll move on from there. Um, the public funding office, we are, there's 20 of us now, and we do cover all of the US, um, both all of public sector, as well as commercial and some of our key accounts. Um, this team is here to help you find the fund. Um, you know, help navigate the questions that are out there, um, help help tear down some of the roadblocks, but most importantly, help you realize the desired outcomes you are looking for in within your entity, if it's a city, if it's a municipality, or a school district, um, or, or on tribal land. We have a full team here to support you. Um, a lot of what we, we do, and, and we do have some customer-facing website, that allows you to look at some best practices. What are other entities like you doing? Um, how are they utilizing the available funds to them to, again, reach their desired outcomes? Um, let's start by going over at a high level, the American Rescue Plan. It's also called CARES, um, CARES 3.0. And I think an important part of this is when we looked at the pandemic and we saw CARES 1 and CARES 2 come out, those are really addressed, set, set, uh, put together to address the emergency. You know, let's let's ensure that we are able to address the emergency, put a bandaid on it, and let's get through this. Now, with the American Rescue Plan Act, these dollars are really put in place for sustainability. Um, as we garner what we've learned from the past with the pandemic. How do we take our entity and, and just like the example we dealt with today, you know, we're, we're not sitting in front of each other. We're doing this over a digital network is how do we take and provide that sustainability for um, for the future. I'm going to touch at a very quick pace. Just what we're seeing um, with the municipalities and the government, but the K through 12, you know, K through 12. Um, I look at the challenges that are was put on the education system. And there are so many available dollars for them as they look for the future. You know, I have the opportunity to talk with a lot of CIOs and CTOs throughout the, the local municipalities, cities, states, as well as school districts. And one thing they all said during the pandemic is that they feel like they're in the game Jumanji. It's day 167. They just they just got over one hurdle, and now they don't know what else is coming at them. So. What we've also seen is is how it's moved up timeline. So when we look at K through 12, there's ESSER dollars that are um, there's ESSER 2.0, and now with the with the American Rescue Plan um, 3.0, that allow schools to address that hybrid learning environment. There's also the continued with the E-rate approach or with the E-rate dollars that provide the infrastructure necessary, necessary to bring all those tablets that we had to, to give out um, during the pandemic so they could do their homework at home to address it as they came back into the school. The same is available for higher ed. There, there's so many dollars that are available in the HERS um, 3.0, um, and it's really, again, to provide that sustainability for the future of the, of the um, higher education. When we look at the state and local government, um, I, I, this is exciting because of what we're seeing a lot of municipality cities and states do is there's an opportunity, you know, a lot of the challenges um, were placed on, on 
on our governments to how do we how do we stay open and how do we continue when all of our city officials are at home. Um, so there, the the dollars that are available um, are really designed. There's 350 billion for state and local fiscal recovery. Um, a lot of it, as long as it is tied back to COVID, the, what is what is great about the American Rescue Plan is it gives a lot of flexibility on what is available. Um, we have put together a lot of case studies and examples of use cases that you can use as we move forward um, over this next year and, pro again, provide that um, sustainability. And we've, as we've moved to the, the digital and Environment. We've seen a lot of pressure be put on our cybersecurity and the infrastructure. You look at the number of attacks that are happening and how important it is for our networks to be protected. And also, also when we look within within uh, our state and local government, is is how do we continue to innovate for the future? Um, and a lot of what we're seeing too is around that the smart and connected communities and providing the infrastructure, provi providing network access to all that are in our communities. Looking at the state and local, there's a, uh, so once the federal dollars and once the ARPA dollars come down to at the state and lo local level, there's a lot of dollars going to the state fiscal recovery fund. Um, there's there's 219 billion to aid in for the states um, to really address again what we we just talked about is how do we how do we continue and provide that sustainability? We've seen 50% uh, of those funds are being dispersed now, and the other 50 are are being dispersed um, next year. And uh, the first tranche is going out now. The second tranche will be going out next year. Um, a lot of what, when we when we look at when we look at within the the state recovery, um, it's important to where where the, my team can help a lot is is when we're looking at the different opportunities of what you're what you are proposing or what are some of the ideas that you have is ensuring that it replaces um, public sector net, net revenue loss. And that's where we can work together to kind of to highlight and put that application together to, to move forward with those ideas. At the beginning, I had mentioned the idea of rethink investment approaches and, and dream of that art of possible. Um, one of the models that my team is, is, has adopted is really dream big. Within the stimulus dollars, it, when we look at the rules and regulations or the, or the eligible service list, it is very broad and it's somewhat vague in a lot of areas. And what we are seeing is, is the importance of not just addressing the immediate needs, but looking into the future to provide sustainability, but then dream big. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, at the state and local level that we're using the term what if. What if you were to get funding? What projects would you look at? Um, we're also seeing the idea of, of using this what if kind of scenario is w w I've heard a lot of at the CTO and CIO level that, hey, my, the budgets have already been identified. The dollars have already been spent. And if you know in your seat that a project is needed and would provide that the future proofing of the network or provide the, the services to the community, what if you were going to, what if you got those fundings, what would it be after? And we've seen, I've seen three or four examples where we put together a solution that went to the board and it ended up being approved. Um, and, and some of that budget was pushed down because of that dreaming big. I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit. Um, the other thing that we're seeing a lot of dollars available and it, it's, it's, it's exciting is on the tribal nations. And I think we do have some representation on the call today is 
throughout the tribal nations of looking at how how they can utilize some of these funds for the tribal nations has been, has been incredible to me with some of the examples I've seen um, throughout the country of of becoming taking their network, ensuring that members within within the tribe have access and are are utilizing some of those funds to even get some revenue back. There's a lot of opportunity there. The other thing I think is important too is, is when we look at the health and human services, we know the impact that the pandemic has had on our healthcare services. Um, there's a lot of, within the three st stimulus buckets, um, there's been a lot of dollars that have been spent to address um, our health care, and it, there continues to be so as we see additional dollars roll out from the federal government. A lot of the dates are are happening now, like we've seen the first three periods of dollars to provide the, the health and human services for COVID relief. But there are also, they're starting to distribute additional dollars that will run from July 1st through December 31st and will be need to, need to be spent by 2023. I know as we're going through this, we're being a lot vague in a lot of, of ways. Um, but I think it's important to note, and this goes back to what I had said earlier, is that there is a lot of discretion of how the, these dollars can be spent. And one of the things I think is important is ensuring that you're not doing funding alone. Um, there is a lot of confusion out there. And as you continue to work with Lumen and as you continue to work with Cisco, that's where we can help not only identify the solution to help you achieve your desired outcomes, but then also put together funding reports of available funds that are out there to meet those needs. Um, the, one of the best practices we are seeing is, is ensuring that you are aware of all the funding aspects, because it may be stimulus, it may be existing grants that are out there. Uh, Cisco does work with the grants office, and along with Lumen, we can put together detailed funding reports to show you that available funding. Um, and it really goes a long way as, as we continue to be strategic in our planning, strategic with our, with our budgets, that we also ensure that we're being strategic with the funding that is available to us. Some of the ad additional funds also for, you know, for healthcare is the Rural Healthcare Connect. There's $800 million available there. And then the Emergency Rural Development Grant for Rural Healthcare, $500 million. Um, the first one is on an annual basis. The $500 million is due by October 12th, so we are running up against some deadlines. And these are just two that I point out because, again, there are there's so much available funding that I think it would be key to ensure that you get in front and understand all that's available. The other thing we'll continue to hear in in every state throughout the nation is what are we going what are we doing about uh, broadband access to the internet and availability to the internet at an affordable cost. I I wanted to bring this slide up because you know one of the things a couple of the things that we're seeing is that it, this is being discussed in every every. Um, every state within the nation, um, and there's a lot that's going going on. If you're working through service providers, if you're utilizing some of the funds to reach some of the rural areas, um, and then also the underserved is ensuring that we ha we are addressing that. There's a lot of dollars that are being put put that are available now, but also in the future with the the proposed infrastructure bill that make available funds um, to address these needs. The important part now is the planning, having the conversation, understanding what is possible, what will be best to be able to serve your communities. Let me just some of the examples we're seeing is, and these are just um, as it relates to broadband, is the um, rural health care pro program um, providing WAN access out into the communities. 
and then the emergency connectivity fund. Um, but then an example that we're seeing in Texas as part of the American Rescue Plan is a capital fund of $450 million to, to Cisco, also utilizing state funds and the city county fund. Um, going back to what I had said earlier is ensuring you're not doing funding alone. That's where Lumen and Cisco are here to have those conversations and help you strategically plan what would be best to serve your communities. The other thing that is important we uh, I wanted to touch on um, is the bipartisan infrastructure bill. These are some potentially technology friendly opportunities that we are seeing. It's important to note that this is still in its infancy. Um, there is a vote on September 27th um, with the House. Um, and if it gets, there's a lot that has to happen there. But as we look at potential, potential funds, you can see there is additional dollars that eventually will come down to your state, into your city, your municipalities that will address a lot of the technology needs. If it be the airport, if it's a, again around broadband, if it's around the ports or ports um, and waterways and transportation, you can kind of see some of the examples that, that are here um, that, that these additional dollars will be able to address. Um, in closing, I, and again, I went through this um, and touched on a lot of the, the areas, but I think going back to what we had said earlier is, is we want the opportunity, we want to understand that this is the opportunity, you know, we're in unprecedented times. This is an opportunity for us to dream big. This is an opportunity to rethink the art of possible and don't do it alone. You know, Lumen and Cisco are here to help. We're also here to help with putting together those customized funding reports that will be able to show you where those funds are available, what dollars are available to you, um, and we're definitely here to help. So, um, so with that, let me turn it back over to you, Brenda. Okay. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, you, that's just an incredible amount of information, and, and uh, we're, as a former state CIO, um, believe me, I would have been uh, making sure that I got access to all of those slides because there's just places there that anybody can use um, to to information to think big and find a way to fund some of those things. So that that was really important. And I, I like that term think big. So so as we're thinking big, I want to really talk about or have you guys talk about how government can use those funds to modernize their IT so that we're not looking at the failures that we experienced during the past pandemic. I think, you know, we hear a lot about the funds being used for broadband. As you said, every state seems to be having some of that conversation. So I want to hear um, some of that, but I really want to see if we can get some examples of not only how people have used the broadband funds to think big, but let's talk about some of the other examples too of, of how people have uh, gotten together, collaborated, and thought big for their entity. So, Tully, you want to talk to us a little bit about a, uh, about an example that uh, you guys have been working on? Yeah, sure, Brenda. I'd love to. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so, so it was really this ARPA funding and this surge of funding that we're experiencing that allowed us to collaborate with one of our tribes. And so um, the tribal community came to us um, with this funding opportunity, and it really sparked an innovation session. And they grabbed their technology partners, uh, luckily they grabbed us and they, they grabbed Cisco, and we came together and we really had a collaboration session around what kind of challenges are you guys experiencing in this tribal community? And, and how can we collaborate with you to overcome these challenges in today's environment? And, and really their, their challenge was specific to broadband. So I, I know that there are a lot of utilizations outside of broadband, but this one was really around how do they serve their community with quality broadband throughout their entire community and to all of their homes. They really had a need to provide services that would enable remote learning as well as healthcare services right into their most remote areas uh, of their communities as well as fire and rescue. 
And so it was really through this collaboration partnership when it was with the tribe, with Cisco, with Lumen, we came together and we all identified what kind of solutions could we design to overcome this challenge and this need to get out to their communities and to get out to every single one of, of their uh, homes there. And we were able to expand our network as well as collaborate on a private LTE service that would expand that broadband service to over 300 homes in their communities that didn't have service before. So these are kids that didn't have access to education and remote learning environments that now have access to that today. And so it was a really great opportunity for our technology uh, community to come together with this tribal community, identify a need, and then really leverage technology to serve their community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the process really looked like. Um, so the process started with that funding, right? So, so they have this, this funding. And then it really went into a collaborative innovation session. And that innovation session, that's exactly where we did what you guys have been talking about. Think big. Think, dream big. What do you need? If you had the funding in order to help your community, what would you deploy? And so that was really happening in that innovation session. And then we designed the, the solution together and then we went through implementation. And so we deployed the solution. But it was really important to the tribal community that they would see beyond just that deployment. So how are they going to um, keep that solution sustainable beyond this big idea and beyond this implementation? And so we were able to really address that concern through some dashboards and through monitoring of their system. So now they can go ahead and manage that system post implementation and ensure that their entire community has very reliable network uh, services and broadband access. And, and, and so it was really through this funding opportunity that enabled this collaboration session that allowed technology partners to partner with our tribal community to deliver these services to these individuals that didn't have access to the service before, providing them with health care, providing them with opportunity for distance learning. So it was really an honor to be a part of this process. And, and that's just one example of how technology partners can really come together and, and have an innovation, innovative solution um, to serve the needs of the community. So with that, I think, um, I think Dan has a couple other uh, a solution specific examples. So I'll hand it back to him. Oh, and thank you, Tony. And I, I, lo I love okay. the examples. Oh, go, Gary, did you have something? Go ahead. No, it's that's all right, Dan. I, I was just going to say that listening to Tully and and, and reliving that experience um, is an inspiration. And, and I was just going to make a couple of comments, and I'll hand it back to you, Dan. But you know, one of the things that uh, Dan said is to dream big and not do, go it alone, and that's certainly true for the public funding portion, uh, Brent, as Brenda shared, as a former CIO, kind of being overwhelmed. I mean, we do have resources at Lumen and Cisco to give you that specific package to tell you what's kind of appropriate and available. So I don't want you to be overwhelmed. But the other part, listening to Tully, is you know, kind of the art of the possible can be overwhelming too. And so don't do it alone on kind of being inspired. And one of the coolest things about my job covering state local education uh, for the US is talking to customers and connecting customers to customers on the problems that they're solving for. So as you're reimagining infrastructure with this unprecedented spending, there are some things, some basic table stakes things that I always kind of convey to my team in helping uh, our customers and Tully spoke of one of them. And that is to, first of all, improve the citizen experience. That's why we're all here. Right. And when, as we're upgrading this infrastructure, please, I, as a technologist, and I'm going to geek out on you for a few minutes, because most of the audience is IT is don't do a like for like trade on just modern. You know, we have to modernize our infrastructure to do the things that Tully just mentioned, right? Deliver, deliver better services to our students and to our, and certainly healthcare to those remote uh, places. Uh, there's four kind of just use cases that I want to just throw out for consideration. And they are a lot more than this. And they tie back to that sort of modernization of infrastructure, you know, and we have examples of these certainly um, online and as you engage Loom and, and Cisco. Uh, but the, the first one is just simply, you know, I know it's kind of boring, but tr taking traditional WAN, wide area network and modernizing that to an SD WAN kind of portfolio uh, platform. Loom and Cisco have done this. There's a 
higher ed customer out west that we recently uh, partnered on, and they had to connect uh, eight research facilities. And um, what they did is Lumen and Cisco partnered together. We transitioned those sites to an SD-WAN um, kind of uh, architecture. It saved them wide area network costs and improved their security posture. And all the, and even more better, it became a cloud managed environment. So we simplified the infrastructure. So taking advantage of reimagining the architecture, those market transitions. Uh, the other one I talked to CIOs on a weekly basis is this prem-based calling to cloud-based calling environment and mainly in call center modernization. I think it's fair to say that none of us could have imagined the call volume to things like uh, unemployment benefits and you know that hit the state workers. There wasn't a technology that could keep up with it. So now as we transition and modernize those call centers, we're using things like AI, right, to help automate that support to our citizens and consolidate um, those, those call centers. So that is another hot topic. Um, security certainly is top of mind for everyone. And so looking at leveraging these funds to improve your uh, security posture is, you know, certainly paramount. And then, of course, you know, fully automated, orchestrated uh, campus environments, network environments is something that we see constantly. So I just wanted, uh, you know, Dan and Brenda and Tully to just sort of aspire on the geeky side of things that, uh, you know, we get some help not only in how we can get funding for that, but certainly engage Lumen and Cisco because we can share the lessons learned from other government leaders uh, around the nation. So that's my plug for all of us uh, geeks at heart. Uh, yeah, I feel like I should just say ditto right now, Gary. I mean, that you took it all. That was awesome. I mean, so, Dan, I'm stepping in front of you for a second because I, you touched on something that is near and dear to both of us that we hear every single day with our, our customers, and that's security. So if you think about um, how the future of work has changed forever and that everything is digital and every year, every day, you're having to consume more and more data. And that data is really powering the functionality of SaaS applications on either the public or the government cloud. It gets really confusing because this has been a profound impact um, in the way that you have to architect, deploy, manage, secure your environment and ultimately on the citizen experience and the way your agencies will function. Um, the pandemic really pressure tested all of us and our environments, and it really shined a light and a very bright light on the changes that we need to make to support it. And, and Gary talked about that a bit. He talked about the art of the possible and thinking big and don't go like for like. And I think everybody on this call would agree you can't. You have to think of the future. The future is not just work or school from anywhere, but it's the compute at the edge. And so when you think about a disproportionate amount of users work, school from home or in remote offices, they need protection even over the network traffic that is going directly to the internet instead of backhauling it to the corporate data center. Threats have evolved. We see these every day. They have become much more aggressive. And as many of you know, um, we have experienced in the SLED world a huge, huge target of advanced cyber threats that take advantage of our big security gaps that we're many of our large cities and local municipalities and schools and states have seen. Um, and one of the answers really lies in the emerging cyber concept of um, SASE or Secure Access Service Edge. And when you think about that, it, it really allows um, control of where inspection takes place, how traffic is routed, what is logged and where the logs are stored and meet privacy and compliance requirements, which is really the bane of all of our existence on a daily basis while supporting your zero trust. It gives you flexibility, cost savings, reduces complexity, increases performance, zero trust, and data protection. You heard Gary talking a little bit about this, and Dan's going to talk a bit more about um, Cisco's umbrella. Really, their security posture. They've been a leader in this for many years. And now with our partnership, Lumen can help you take that next step with SASE, with a digitized zero trust work from anywhere cloud-based computing to enable which enables everywhere anytime access from any device and that's something you're all looking at every single day and one of the comments i heard all of them talk about already is 
choose your partners wisely. Your technology partner is going to take you beyond the horizon. And I think right now, with the information that's coming at you in so many ways, it's really, really important to take your time and evaluate what you have out there. And this is the fun part of all of our jobs, because between Gary and I, we have a very broad breadth of our ability to see the horizon and missteps and great steps that our customers are taking and helping guide into the future. So it's just something I wanted to talk about because I hear in every conversation we're having around security, SASE is coming up now and everyone, all our customers are trying to figure out what does that really mean for their security posture. That's it, I'll quit interrupting. <laughs> no, Sonia and Gary, I think you hit it right on, on the head. And it's funny when I look at some of the examples, um, you know, they're in, align with, in alignment with what you guys have just said. And I think to Gary's point where he said no two solutions are the same is I've seen different transport, uh, transportation authorities. They both had needs for securities that you addressed, Sonia, and they both went about it totally different. Um, but in the end, it was the understanding of that need and get, getting there. Um, we're also seeing, Gary, you touched on call centers um, at the state level where people are calling in for services. I've seen it in two or three states, but then also in cities where they had to stand up quickly a telehealth solution. And like, how do you do that quickly? But it's all possible with the available funds, with the partners, um, and, and being able to dream big. So. There's so many more examples too that I would love to set down and push you back to our um, landing page too that has the case studies of di different. Uh, you know, we I think we have about two dozen different case studies to walk through of examples of what others are doing, but then keeping in mind that everyone is different, and we're truly here to help you align to your desired outcomes with the with the funding available. Yeah. And, and I would actually put a challenge out there. I think you should expect more from all of your technology partners today. Expect a lot out of us. Bring us together, bring us together, identify uh, what those needs are and allow us to innovate and collaborate together with you and with each other in order to serve our community. Uh, this is a time where we all need to come together and we, and we really need to make sure that we're serving together to our communities. So um, I would just say challenge us. Yeah, that's always, you know, I think we, we forget that that's something we really should do as, as people who provide services to citizens. We need to challenge the people that are helping us get there and they need to challenge back at, at the government entities as well, because as we've heard over and over again, you don't want to, I, I can't tell you the number of projects we had where you would bring something new in and then we would modify the entire thing to do exactly what we, the old one did that we hated. So, um, you know, again, I, I think it's a challenge of both ways. And, and I, I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes uh, people on the government side forget to challenge their providers and the people that they're partnering with to say, help me understand what I don't understand. So, exactly. I want to remind the audience, um, there is a Q&A box and, and uh, we're going to be coming up on the Q&A section here pretty soon. So, uh, if you've got any questions, please type those into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll try to get to those as, as many as we can. So, I, I want to I touch on something just a little bit different, but still in the same vein of where we're going here. Um, you know, we, we talk about getting into these projects, challenging each other, uh, partnering, that sort of thing. So, what best practices should we be really looking at? And, and then even more importantly, probably, because this is where I always wondered, is um, what are the pitfalls we need to be avoiding? So, um, Sonia, you want to start with that one? I'm going to kind of pick on you. Sorry. Well, yeah, no, that's okay. And I think everybody's touched on it. Um, one of the things that works very, very well from a best practice is an innovation session. This is... Um, oh my gosh, I hate to use this word, particularly as a salesperson, but I'm going to use it. 
it's where we gather the information that is needed to really assess the solution. And these are free consulting sessions, if you will. Um, and that's the word I never like to use, but I, I think best practices are really open the kimono. Where are you going? What are the outcomes you're trying to uh, achieve? What is that citizen engagement model that you're looking for? What is that art of the possible and thinking big? And how do we bring it back in? And that's where it's so critical to really pick and choose your technology partners um, very, very closely to align with the business outcomes and the engagement capabilities that you're looking for. Um, what we see um, to Mike's point, uh, to Gary's point a little bit earlier, um, it gets very, very confusing out there. And it's sometimes easier to swap like for kind of like, um, and that is not going to get you into the horizon anymore. I mean, we talked a little bit about, I think um, Dan brought up transportation and how transportation is rapidly modernizing, you know, using um, um, smart circuits and IOT, but what they're using on top of this is now AI and ML, right? And these are very, very, you know, if you think about where we were four years ago, five years ago, if you think about where we are today, it's light years away. And what do you do with that data? How do you take it? How do you acquire it? How do you analyze it? How do you action it? You have to have the right partners to be able to help you through that process. And it's, it's discoverable. The entire process is discoverable. And you take that discoverable information and build insights. And that's how you slowly build what the future looks like. You can't just go into it with a preconceived notion because it always modifies, I guess I would say. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm um, always looking at partners and, and when I've been doing that and going, okay, um, exactly how are we going to do this? And like you said, one of my biggest questions is, I have 800 years of data over here. What are we going to do with that? And, and where are we going next? And, and Tully, you're laughing way too much. So you need to, you need to probably chime in here. What are some of the other things we need to be looking at as we move forward? I, you know, I, I really think that you nailed it, Brenda. Um, so I, I think it's not just about the deployment of technology to, to solve a problem. But it's really about how do you make that deployment uh, sustainable and how do you make it continue to function once deployed and then how do you grow upon that? And so if you're collecting data, it's not about just the collection of data. How do you analyze that data and use that data in order to uh, serve, serve your community or serve, serve those who are serving the community, right? So many times it's information that states and governments just need to be aware of and you need to know not only how to store it, but how to utilize that in order to serve the community better. So um, I, I think all of this really comes from collaboration. It comes from thinking differently. And so, um, I, you know, when you ask, you know, what are some of the pitfalls that we see? That's one of the pitfalls that, that is out there today is that we're thinking about just the immediate project. And we're not thinking about how that's going to sustain and how that's going to grow and lead into to future projects as well. Hey, Dan, I know you've done these things over and over and over again and talked to a lot of people about the funding. Uh, talk a little bit about um, people that come in and, and visit with you. How well do they really need to know what they've got and what they're really doing today? Yeah, I, I think it's it's two parts. It is when you say what they got, meaning what they got as as the network or with funding. What they've got with the network, with funding, with yeah. everything, sustainability, the whole ball of wax. Right, and I think that's that, that's one thing that I look at the stimulus dollars is is and and it was just mentioned is that opportunity for creating the sustainability. So understanding what you have now, but more importantly, where you want to go. Um, a lot of the CTOs and CIOs that I'm talking to are even saying with this funding, it's given them an opportunity to start checking off some of their wish lists. You know, traditionally, what did they want or what did, what did they want to try? They might not have the budget to do it. Now they have that, the, the budget to do it. You, you've heard it several times, dream big. But then have that roadmap of where you want to go it is so, so important because of the upcoming um, the additional fundings that are, are coming out as well. 
Perfect. Um, we're to that point where we're ready to do our Q and A's, but I'm not seeing any questions. Maybe my screen's just not refreshing, but I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm just going to keep asking questions because I always have hundreds of questions. It seems like. Um, so, Dan, am I too late to the party? I mean, I know some of these things have to be used by deadlines. Is this is this funding? Am I too late? Is the funding going to be yeah. too gone? The Great question, Brenda, and, and the answer is no. Um, with with what we're continuing to see from the administration and and even with the American Rescue Plan, this the, the American Rescue Plan will do, be designed over the next couple of years, and then with the infrastructure bill that we touched on, that will go through to uh, 2025. So there, you're definitely not late, and the time is now to start having those conversations, start that planning, and and go from there. Great question, Brenda. Yeah, so uh, and I'm I'm going to probably ask Gary this prop question and if you don't know the answer, it's okay, Gary, you can say you don't know, but uh, you know, as, as I'm starting to put some of these projects in front of you, as you're starting to talk to CIOs and having these conversations and you're putting these projects in front of them. Um, what are what are some of the questions you're getting back from them as far as the pitfalls that they need to be aware of for the federal funds? Uh, when they're thinking big, are they actually talking outside of just their government entity? Uh, what kind of things are you seeing that way? Well, I'm not sure if this is um, the, the kind of ex exact question, but you know, here's what I'm seeing. What's really really exciting about conversations over the past 12 months since the pandemic, Brenda, with customers, that's um, been different from the past decades that we all grew up in this business. Uh, and telling kind of talked about it, like oftentimes or historically, we would get caught up in sort of the technology and the minutia of deployment and the project. And really what the pandemic afforded all of us in IT is it pushed the entire country, heck, the entire world out the door. And we had to sort of react to it right away. And we had to use whatever we could with duct tape and glue and bubble gum to sort of keep people working. And then when we got to the fall, you know, we sort of started to like clean up the, all the mess that we created from an IT perspective. And then, you know, the reimagine has started as we kind of entered this calendar year. And so, you know, what's different about our conversations now, and they kind of, you would always say that, you know, hey, we always did that or we always should have been doing that. But I, I think today it's different. I think, you know, we look at now teachers, for example, and, you know, we say, okay, you know, what, you know, it's not about video in the classroom, right? It's about, and it's not about teachers looking into a Logitech web, Logitech webcam or a laptop. It's how do we put, you know, teachers back in their native form, which is standing in front of a classroom and allowing them to teach not only to the children in the room, but those who may be home, you know, due to the quarantine or in a future state, home sick, sorry, children, there will be no more snow days ever again. Um, that's a thing of the past. And how many parents will ever have to kind of go, you know, drive to school for a parent teacher conference? I think, you know, parent, parents and teachers alike will just want to do a, you know, high quality video call. So it's really kind of changed. I think, you know, we always did an okay job on kind of what are we trying to improve with technology? But I think with COVID and the pandemic, it sort of thrust those use cases and those, those potentials of improvements uh, on us. And, you know, I would just say, you know, engage, 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 and certainly engage with Lumen and Cisco, but engage with others because there are so many great use cases that came out of this really, really unfortunate period for all of us um, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think as a CIO, and Brenda, you can share this with me because you've been in those shoes for many years. I think you're, you're worried about two things, right? You're worried about risk, you know, and, you know, kind of, you know, where you've done this before and kind of, you know, what is, what, what's the expected outcome? And these use cases are so pervasive now that it gives, you know, CIOs and IT leaders confidence that, hey, you know, I can benefit from what other customers are doing in the state, local education market. Um, certainly through uh, industry partners like Lumen and Cisco. So I don't know if that was a direct answer to your question, Brenda, but kind of inspired my thought of what's different now compared to a year, a year and a half ago. Well, and I think that's kind of where I was going with that question because it is different than it was a year or a year and a half ago. And, and it, I mean, considerably different. We've got entities that are talking about, you know, um, we will never bring 100% of our workforce back into the office. And I think that the, that we, as we start having those discussions, and I'm, I'm kind of 
tweaking the audience for part two of this series that's going to be coming out because we're going to be talking about uh, what do you do in the new hybrid but um and how we collaborate in the new hybrid environment but uh i, I think it it is a situation where like you said we, we we did what we had to do we got people working from their homes or you know their bicycles if we had to but we got people working where they were at and now it's what does this look like now or what happens next and 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 i think that's that's something when people are thinking big they need to be thinking outside of we're going to go back to what it was in 2019 or 2018 and and be that environment again i don't think and that's we're never, and we're never going back i mean um and i think we have to think post pandemic right because eventually there will be a post pandemic period but it's again, it's those experiences that our citizens, our students, our teachers, our employees, you know, all the above, what they've experienced, um, you know, is is not going to go away. So it's not just kind of what we need to do yeah. during a short period, to your point, Brenda, but it really is kind of what is the art of the possible now when we do return to this new normal. So it's kind of cool. Well, I think it's a great time to be in technology. I think it's awesome. I, I do too. And and if, if you think about it, Gary, I mean, what we think about what so many of us were doing when we were when we were home and we were in lockdown, we were ordering off of Amazon, we were downloading Netflix, and there's an ease of use there. And now that ease of use has translated into every aspect of our work life, school life. And that's the expectation. So it's not even a possibility to think about what it looked like yesterday. This is why the importance of this partnership of how do you get beyond the future? How do you look beyond the horizon to ensure that you have the stability, the creativity, the financial capabilities and the solutions that really are going to resonate? Because at the end of the day in state, local government, um, education, it's about the citizen engagement, the citizen experience, the school, the student experience. Ultimately, that's, that's the end of the rainbow. How do we improve that? And I think it's been a wonderful testament to our customers on how quickly they reacted in an environment that nobody knew. You know, when, when I say pressure testing, we all got pressure tested. And those who were down that road of modernization were able to react a little quicker than others. But everybody steps back and realizes we've got very convoluted security postures. We have to uncomplicate now everything has moved to a cloud and as a service how do we manage that and so those are the the conversations that we're we're having on a daily basis and truly you know we're in an unprecedented time of funding and more funding is potentially coming coming and the marketplace has never seen that and so the opportunity to really live in the art of the possible is here today it's what our customers are thinking about and it's how you know, powerful partners can get them there. Um, I've had a couple questions come across on the Q&A about whether the presentation will be available. And yes, we're going to email the presentation slides and um, a link to the recorded webinar to everyone who is on this call. So yes, you will get that. Um, the, someone asked about some specific funding questions. I think once you see the um slides up close you'll be able to find uh the answer to that question because there i think i saw what you are looking for what your question was but this is an interesting question um i was it were asked what do you say to a state government budget official who cautions that this federal money is a one-time infusion and once it's spent to build the new capability the state has to follow find the money to sustain the operations in the following years well, I think really quickly, that is that is why it's so critical to choose the right partner, whether it's ARPA funding or infrastructure funding, the partner that has the depth of knowledge of the funding and is also capable of structuring a financial solution that recognizes the ability to capitalize and provide a fully managed implementation to meet deliverables, um, that many in SLED IT groups are running very lean to do. Um, you have to have those partners that can bring flexibility into the financial arena because that's how you build sustainability because they're worried about, okay, this money runs out. How am I going to pay for it? Right? And that's, that's okay. all in the way you create it. I would also add, add Brenda. Oh, go ahead, go ahead Gary. No, go, go ahead. 
I would also add that um, in the use case that I uh, that I spoke about, like with the traditional WAN to SD WAN that Lumen and, and Cisco did, the, in one of the examples, is that I'm, I'm a big believer of uh, sort of Clayton Christensen, the author of the Innovator's Dilemma, right? So Brenda, as you know, as a state CIO, this is why you know, kind of like for like versus like for um, you know, kind of modern uh, modernization. The one thing that we know from the Innovator's Dilemma is tex technology is a disruptive force. And so as we introduce next generation technologies, we should be gaining efficiencies and reducing operating costs. So you have existing operating costs today. And if you are doing modernization correctly, then you should actually see, you know, kind of a reduction of your operating costs. I mean, think about kind of the call center modernization that everybody's dealing with. You can't throw enough bodies at this, right? So you, you know, the, the state local governments were throwing, you know, hiring agents, throwing bodies at it. But as you modernize your contact center and introduce things like AI, you're reducing your operating environment, operating costs. That's the nature of technology when done right. Right, I agree. Dan, did you have something you wanted to add real quick here? Yeah, the only thing I would, I would add too is, is on top of a partner is, is ensuring that the manufacturer also understands that, that a lot of the stimulus is CapEx dollars and ensuring there's a, there are bundles, there's solutions that are given to the partner that they can pass on to the customer that that do align with how you're procuring technology with the federal dollars. Exactly. That are capex friendly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm I'm going to take one last question here, and uh, we will at, we try to get somebody to answer every single question that is on the chat here before we. Um, line this up or complete this so you will get an answer. But this one is um, everyone's talking about zero trust architecture design strategies. What are your views on this and where should government organizations consider first in framing and funding their priorities? I, I could I take that one, Brenda. I think that, and we could have a whole hour discussion on zero trust and it's such an important topic, we should. So right. this is it's something that I think you should engage your industry partners on. But I think it, it start it always it should always start with architecture, right? And I think that one of the things we have to recognize, again, using that reference of a market transition, uh, Sonia spoke about it, but as Cisco, we say, hey, identity is the new perimeter. And so what do we mean by that? So if you think about the architecture of a decade ago to today as it relates to cybersecurity, a decade ago, 90, 95% of our traffic went from my laptop over the internet in a secured fashion through a VPN, sitting in a data center to an app, a server and application sitting into an enterprise data center. 10 years later, that's completely different. With all the software as a service, uh, you know, my data goes right from my laptop into a sat into an application, you know, hosted in a cloud in a pub in a cloud somewhere. And so, you know, part of it is a recognition that your architecture can't be antiquated and just focusing on firewalls, right? Mm -hmm. Now what you need is this, that's what, you know, zero trust and the SASE transition that Sonia mentioned is all about. Recognizing that our your network traffic isn't the same as it was a decade ago and re-architecting to make sure that um, you know, you are, you are, you know, having security at your edge and, um, and that is, uh, there is plenty of material out there, but as industry partners, um, defining your SASE architecture is really paramount in a zero trust world. Super. I, I, I just want to be real respectful of everybody's time. Um, so I am going to probably start to close this down here. Um, I was looking to see if there was one more and there is one more question that um, <clears throat> if we can make it a really short answer, would you recommend to state government IT organizations that while dreaming big, they also be specific in identifying new capabilities that suit a hybrid work model? Can you point to examples of states handling that quite well? Uh, we might not get to the examples, but is that it? I, my guess is that's going to be a best practice that you would talk about. Sonia, you want to? jump on that one? Well, I, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about a little bit ago, right? With innovation summits and sessions and really iterating on that process. Do think big. There's no reason you shouldn't be thinking big, but you need to you need to have some specifics because how do you get to your outcomes, both your your citizen experience and your business objectives that you need to get to, right? So that that's how we bake in solutions and start to that iterative process. But I think you can absolutely do both dream big with specifics perfect I to do it really quickly 
<laughs> you did good. So I'm going to, we, this is supposed to end at noon and it is noon. So I'm going to close this out. I want to uh, make sure that uh, I thank Dan and Sonia and Tully and Gary for sharing their insights on this webcast. This has been fabulous. I also want to thank again, uh, Lumen and Cisco for making it possible for us to have this important webcast discussion today. There will be a part two. You keep stay tuned for your local stations to uh, hear the details on that. And thanks to our audience for spending time with us. We look forward to seeing you again soon on another government technology event. Have a great day, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Gary. Thank you. Bye, Dan.